Welcome to this special podcast from the People's Pharmacy. We're delighted to bring you an interview with Dr. Marvin Singh, an integrative gastroenterologist who is also board certified in internal medicine. Dr. Singh is Director of Integrative Gastroenterology at the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute at the University of California at Irvine. He brings a unique perspective to the practice of precision medicine. During this podcast, we'll provide insights into improving your intestinal health. You'll learn a lot more about the microbiome and how to reestablish healthy gut balance. This special podcast is available only to podcast subscribers. It's brought to you by the Verizona Health Club. This comprehensive home testing service enables you to track crucial health markers of gut health, inflammation, metabolism, hormones, thyroid function, and many other organ systems. Regular testing can help detect health imbalances before they lead to sickness. Welcome back to the People's Pharmacy, Dr. Marvin Singh. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm super excited to be back talking with you. Dr. Marvin Singh, if you could give our listeners a quick overview of integrative gastroenterology, what is it? What makes it unique? And what do you do specifically as an integrative gastroenterologist? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, integrative medicine is basically, it's it's good medicine. And that's what Dr. Weil taught us on the first day of our fellowship program where we did this training in integrative medicine. It means that we are looking at all of the things that any other doctor would look at, making sure we're doing the workup in the way that any other doctor would do a workup, but also paying attention to all the other things that can affect somebody's life and health that most doctors may not actually pay attention to at all. Looking at the person from a holistic or whole body perspective to try to optimize their health. And we're looking at lifestyle factors, diet factors, exercise, sleep, mindfulness, you name it, and really trying to help people get healthy from a very comprehensive perspective. And if there is an opportunity to to use a medication or a treatment that's more natural, um, then certainly we use that because as, as many of us may know, there are treatments for certain things that are just as, if not more effective than uh, traditional medications that are available. And uh, if that's the case, then why not? Because usually the impact to your whole body, your whole health will be more favorable when you do use these natural therapies. And so integrative gastroenterology is taking these concepts of focusing on the whole person, the whole body, mind, body, and soul, and using that perspective to help people in the best way, using as many tools as you can in your toolbox. Well, we want to find out more about that, but we also want to talk about COVID. People have thought of this as a lung disease, and they've recognized that it has neurological implications. For example, the loss of the sense of smell and taste is clearly neurological, and they have actually recognized that there are cardiovascular implications. What about the digestive tract? It seems like maybe it's one of the first to actually see that virus that may come in through the respiratory system, but could also come in through the digestive tract. Yeah, that's a very uh, uh, interesting topic. And, you know, I think there's still a lot we have to learn about this virus, even though we've been dealing with it for uh, well over a year and a half now. But um, we do know that the virus can replicate in the digestive tract and that it can be found in the gut. There are stool tests even that can check for COVID in the stool. Uh, we're talking about COVID-19. Um and uh, we know that those uh, there's some emerging uh, literature uh, recently, I think in the last month or so, talking about how those who have an imbalanced gut microbiome may be more susceptible to having severe disease. And so um, it's definitely an important topic, and it's something that I talk to uh, talk about with my patients all the time as far as you know optimizing your gut health and you know, even after if somebody did get COVID, um, we do, uh, I do see at least people who have digestive symptoms and where they may not have had 
much of any digestive symptoms beforehand, but maybe have more uh, kind of an irritable bowel type of picture afterwards. And, you know, that may be likely related to imbalances in the microbiome that that uh, came from having an infection and having gone through that. We had an opportunity to speak with Dr. Sharon A. Lodog uh, not too long ago, mm -hmm. and she called it dysbiosis, a big word, after COVID infections. And so I guess the first question is, what is dysbiosis? How would you know you have it? And what can you do to correct it? Great questions. And um, when I say the word imbalance, that actually is this, you could think of that as the same thing as dysbiosis. So dysbiosis really means an imbalance in the the bacteria in the microbiome. So there may be populations of bacteria that are too much and some that are too little, and it's just not the right mix of things. And as a result, people can have a variety of different kinds of symptoms um, uh, associated with that. And um, there are some ways that you can find out. I mean, there are some high quality whole microbiome genome sequencing tests that can be done. Um, I do these often in, in Precision Clinic, my practice, and we look at the microbiome. I look at how diverse the microbiome is, um, look at, uh, you know, how many unfavorable populations there are, how well uh, established some of the keystone, the good species are, and how well the microbiome is performing its functions. And uh, I use that information to help build uh, recommendations for people on how to get back into what we would call a eubiosis, more of a balance rather than an imbalance. Dr. Singh, what sorts of symptoms would tip someone off that they might have an imbalance? And then I'll ask you about what they can do about it. Yeah. So, you know, different people may have different things. You may not necessarily even have a gut uh, symptom uh, as far as your abdomen uh, is concerned. You may have joint inflammation. You may have skin issues. You know, it could be a hormonal imbalance. There could be a wide variety of different things that uh, you could have uh, that could be uh, finding its roots in the gut digestively. Sometimes people may have bloating or nausea, either constipation or diarrhea, abdominal discomfort, um, and, and things like that. Those are perhaps some common um, symptoms that people might have when there's an imbalance in the microbiome. Dr. Singh, I'm astonished because what you're suggesting is that other organ systems could be affected by the imbalance in your GI tract. I think most people, when they think, oh, I've got a belly ache, okay, that's in my belly. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got diarrhea, I've got constipation, I've got reflux. I mean, there are all kinds of things that happen to the abdomen, to the digestive tract, but skin, th yeah. I, that's not, that's, nobody would put together the idea that the skin could be affected by the dysbiosis of the GI tract. What about your brain? Yeah, brain too. Um, brain is a big one. You know, this microbiome is in our gut, uh, but it, it, I guess we should clarify that we have multiple microbiomes. The mi the microbiome in the, the, the gut is uh, obviously the largest population of uh, bacteria in one place, but we have a skin microbiome. Um, we have uh, all kinds of microbiomes. There's data on the eye microbiome, lung microbiome, you know, uh, the various different uh, pods of microbes. And, you know, I don't know that we have any great data or literature to really suggest how they interact with each other or if they do, how they do. But my kind of feeling is that uh, perhaps the microbiome in the gut is kind of like the headquarters. If you think of it kind of like a military operation and, and uh, when there's a problem uh, somewhere else that there's a communication between um, the gut microbiome and other microbiomes, uh, perhaps through various different kinds of signaling um, that they that they have, uh, whether it's by metabolites being released or hormones, neuro, neurotransmitters or other chemicals. And, um, you know, this could be uh, how you have a problem. Uh, uh, and it could also be how problems could get solved by looking at the gut microbiome and 
and uh, you know people can have improvement in joint pains and skin issues uh, like eczema and allergies when they focus on gut health as well. So there's probably a bi-directional communication there, just like with the brain, as you were mentioning. The brain and the gut are very uh, closely tied to each other. We know there's this brain-gut connection, and they can both influence each other. So the brain can actually influence the composition of the gut microbiome, and actually the gut microbiome and the chemicals that it may release can influence the brain in how we think, how we feel, how we sense pain, and things like that. So they're very intricately connected to each other. So gut health equals brain health. That's what we, I usually tell. We people. we have a friend who um, who complains sometimes that when he's under stress, when there's a lot going on, when there are a lot of challenges, when there are issues that have to be resolved, he feels it in his gut. He, yeah. he has to go to the bathroom quite frequently. And so this idea of gut brain connection, I think a lot of people experience that kind of symptom. Mm -hmm. Very much so. And sometimes the best treatment is not a medicine. It's talking to somebody, learning about their environment and what's going on in their life and, and talking to them about that and working through that and mindfulness techniques and stress reduction techniques. Sometimes that's the most powerful medicine. I actually tell people that's my favorite medicine because it doesn't cost anybody anything. You just you just have to learn the technique and and do it, and you can do it any time, any place. So you know, there's there's a lot of research suggesting that the microbiome uh, can play a, a variety a role in a variety of neuropsychiatric conditions. The gut, in itself, it has approximately a hundred million neurons, which is more than the spinal cord even has, and it produces most of the body's serotonin. So. You know, uh, certainly there is the capacity to make a uh, neurologic impact uh, uh, just by focusing on gut health. Now, Dr. Singh, let us ask about, you mentioned before, optimizing gut health. Let's ask about someone who has recovered, let us say, from COVID-19 and who wants to really get their microbiota back into balance. What do you recommend? Well, I'm a I'm a precision medicine guy, so often I will like to make recommendations based on information. That's probably the most scientific uh, approach that I could think. So I would encourage, you know, uh, a few simple tests to kind of get an idea of what's going on in the microbiome. But outside of that, I guess we could make some presumptions if somebody didn't want to do testing and just presume maybe there's an imbalance um, uh, in the microbiome and kind of focus on some empiric uh, recommendations. And some of the things that are the easiest to do that don't require any medications are really optimizing your lifestyle factors because we know um, that, you know, exercising and proper nutrition, well-balanced diet with plenty of plants in the diet, um, stress reduction, optimal sleep hygiene, avoiding toxic exposures, um, having fun, enjoying life, staying connected to your family and friends. We know that all of these things can actually influence the microbiome. It's uh, there's, there's good amount of data talking about each of these different categories and how these lifestyle measures can impact microbiome health. I actually written a book chapter uh, in our integrative gastroenterology textbook on lifestyle measures and the gut microbiome and review some of the literature there suggesting that people who exercise have a more diverse microbiome, people that eat a well-balanced diet uh, uh, with plentiful, uh, colorful fruits and vegetables have a better, uh, more diverse microbiome. And even sleeping properly improves the balance of your microbiome because we know that those who have altered circadian rhythms and aren't sleeping very well, we know that in those people, the microbiome pattern may shift to a more inflammatory pattern and really um, have similarities uh, amongst those who have problems with uh, weight gain or difficulty losing weight. So um, uh, there, these correlations are definitely outlined in the literature. And these are some of the, the best medicine to give to people because they're lifestyle measures. And uh, these lifestyle measures not only will optimize your gut health, but will optimize your heart health and your brain health and your lung health and everything health. 
Dr. Singh, there are situations, however, where no matter how good your lifestyle, no matter how good your diet, there are challenges. And I'm thinking something that you probably do quite frequently, certainly your colleagues do, and that's colonoscopies. <laughs> and I'm thinking antibiotics. People have taken a lot of antibiotics over the course of this COVID year. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about all of the challenges that are that are out there, the C. diff infections, the proton pump inhibitors that people are popping like candy, you know, the Nexiums and the Prilosex and the Previces that are now available over the counter. And I'm thinking, how do we reestablish that microbiome? What role does, for example, probiotics have when it comes to you know, post colonoscopy after you've quote unquote cleaned out your your lower GI tract? And what about after a course of antibiotics or perhaps after a recovering from COVID? Yeah, definitely probiotics um, can play a role in helping to uh, find that balance in the microbiome again. Um, I use probiotics all the time. And um, certainly, you know, one of the most uh, impactful things is to look at what are the underlying factors that could be driving the imbalance? Because it's kind of like saying, well, if I if I take a probiotic, then it's okay if I go to Taco Bell and McDonald's for lunch and dinner. No, that's really not okay. <laughs> well, you know? I, I have a friend who who is a physician and like uh, he's been taking statins for years. And he said, well, you know, I can have that uh, that ice cream sundae, no problem. Right. My lipids are going to look fabulous because I'm taking Crestor. Mm -hmm. Exactly what I'm talking about. So, you know, you know, you may be taking a medication that might be impacting a number, but what are you doing to the microbiome, you know, and especially over the long period of time? Um, so I always look at things in that perspective. What's happening to the microbiome when you do X, Y, or Z? And, you know, uh, nothing really replaces life, uh, proper lifestyle changes. So, you know, you can eat all the bad food that you want, uh, but and taking a probiotic as a reaction to that isn't really going to be the solution. If you do both, improve your diet and take probiotics, then you may get much better, faster yield out of that. Okay. So, Dr. Singh, let's get specific what do your microbes like to eat? What should you be feeding them? <laughs> you should be feeding them a wide variety of different kinds of foods because the microbes like to eat different things, just like you like to eat different things. So if you have chicken and rice one day, if you had chicken and rice every day of the week, that's kind of boring. And it's boring for the microbes too. They want to have a, a bunch of different kinds of foods. And we want to feed them plenty of vegetables and fruits. And notice I say vegetables before fruits because we mm -hmm. want to watch how much sugar intake we're having in general and focus on um, uh, vegetables uh, over fruits uh, if possible. And uh, really the key ingredient amongst those things is fiber. Because when the bacteria digest the fiber, they make this substance called a short chain fatty acid. And that is... Basically, you can think of it as a postbiotic. So we have prebiotics, which are the bacteria that you can take. Uh, probiotics are the bacteria you can take. Prebiotics are like the fertilizer for those good bacteria. You can take it. It's like a fiber type of a fiber supplement. And then we have postbiotics. And these are uh, your, an example of which is like a short chain fatty acid, like butyrate, for example. So sometimes people take that as a supplement, but you can naturally give yourself that as a supplement as well by eating the foods that will allow the microbiome to create it naturally. And that's where the whole conversation on plants comes from. Um, when you have a lot of short chain fatty acids, uh, you can reduce inflammation and create a better atmosphere in your microbiome. So there's more than just the simple reason of plants are good for you. There's, there's a reason why plants are good for you, and, and that's the reason why. If someone, for example, had to take a course of antibiotics mm -hmm. or had to go in for their colonoscopy, and we hope that all the people who have delayed doing that over the course of the last year or so from COVID uh, will get in and have their colonoscopy uh, when they get that opportunity. So 
if they've had the colonoscopy, if they've taken a course of antibiotics, maybe if they've taken PPIs for their heartburn, how would they know which probiotics are the most helpful for overall gut health? What bacterial strains do you generally look for in your probiotics? Yeah. um, So, you know, when we're looking at just for general gut health to try to optimize uh, overall health, we want to look at kind of a broad spectrum probiotic. Maybe there'll be a little bit of some uh, bacillus spores in there. Maybe there'll be some lactobacillus species, bifidobacterium species, some of the, you know, very healthful strains that we know that are generally good for our gut health that we want to include. And this may be a uh, a good way to start is looking at kind of a broad spectrum probiotic that has a bunch of different strains in it. And what about acid? I mean, it seems like we have incredibly effective acid suppressing drugs, but wasn't Mother Nature thinking that acid was a good thing when you know, so many different species have acid in their stomachs. Yeah, I know. I mean, we, we actually need acid to digest food. And um, this is a, it's a good topic. It's a big topic because we, we, we've been talking about acid suppressors, these PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. And when we take them to reduce heartburn, most, most of the time related to particular foods that we're eating or diet and lifestyle, you know, issues, uh, to try to circumvent those symptoms, uh, what we're doing is we may be helping the symptom, but we're reducing the acidity in the stomach. And as a result, our digestion may not be optimal. And as a result, as well, um, uh, the bacteria in the gut may become imbalanced as well. And so um, uh, you can have a lot of downstream issues that potentially could occur as a result of acid suppression. And you know, um, I, I generally try to avoid these antacids uh, as much as possible um, and try to use natural therapies. Obviously, there may be certain circumstances where somebody may benefit from that best in their circumstance, uh, whatever's going on in their health. Uh, but um, we generally try to use natural treatments like DGL, for example, or Slippery Elm uh, Marshmallow. There are different herbal therapies that we can use that can help us reduce those feelings of reflux without actually shutting down the proton pumps that make the acid in our stomach. And finally, Dr. Singh, I think a lot of people have seen commercials for things like Cologuard, you know, a a test that they can do at home. And and that's great as a first step. Uh, Hopefully, we'll not eliminate colonoscopy, but we'll help people know when they should have colonoscopy. But the idea of testing the microbiome, it, it, it seems like that is such an essential first step in, in establishing good gut health. How can people even get a sense of what's going on in their digestive tract when it comes to their microbiome? Are there home tests? Yeah, there are home tests. Um, you order them from the company, they mail them to your house, and you do the stool sample there and you mail them back. And now there are a lot of different kinds of tests out there with different sequencing methodologies and some may be uh, not as great and some may be more high quality. And so really aligning yourself with a provider that understands the microbiome and microbiome testing and what kind of responses to give based on those results is probably important because you may get a wide variety of answers from uh, a wide variety of tests. And uh, we want to make sure that the answers you're getting are as accurate as we can make them. Dr. Singh, the final message for our listeners about how to maintain good digestive health? Yeah, the way to maintain good digestive health is really um, doing some of the simple things, making sure you're eating a balanced and varied diet with plenty of vegetables and fruits, reducing stress is a big one. Um, uh, looking at your environment and what toxins you may be exposed to is also another big one. We haven't really, we didn't talk too much about that. And then, you know, supporting 
uh, proper sleep and hydration. All these basics of, of life and lifestyle are, are crucial to optimal gut health. And then uh, I always stress learning about your microbiome and what's going on inside because you may feel totally fine and not feel like you have any symptoms at all, but your gut may be fixing to... Uh, you know, re release a bomb or something at some point, you may not even really be aware of it until it actually happens. And so one of the best ways to be on top of your health is looking into these aspects so that we can make certain interventions if you need probiotics, for example, or other kinds of supplements to support inflammation that may be happening in the gut so that you don't develop a problem later on. Dr. Marvin Singh, Thank you so much for talking with us on The People's Pharmacy today. No problem. You've been listening to Dr. Marvin Singh. He is Director of Integrative Gastroenterology at the Susan Samueli Integrative Health Institute at the University of California, Irvine. This podcast is brought to you in part by Kaya Biotics, probiotic products made in Germany from certified organic ingredients. K-A-Y-A Biotics.com From Durham, North Carolina, I'm Joe Graydon. And I'm Terry Graydon. Thank you for listening to this special episode of the People's Pharmacy Podcast. <laughs>